Can you hear me okay? Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about something I've been investigating the last uh, few months, and that's uh, digital drugs and humanity and algorithms. Um, so kind of the idea of where we're going with technology and how it's integrated with us and how it can influence who we are. Um, so in my practice, I like to take art and technology as a way to study humanity. Um, so to really understand that, you got to understand my personal theory of who we are and where we've come from in a sense. Um, and I think the idea of this monkey bone evolution makes sense to me in so much that the first time a, you know, a gorilla took a, uh, took a femur and started using it as a club, technology was invented, um, and then food was easier to get, uh, things like art and philosophy could then spring out of that. Um, I think since then we've been co-evolving along with technology. So looking at technology makes a lot of sense when looking at who we are and also the things that influence, influence us uh, in the world. Um, that's my hypothesis. Technology is very human. It's as human as language. Um, one can think of that as a, a thing that was invented at, at some point. Obviously, no other animal really speaks or communicates on the level that we do. Um, so I create some artistic interactions or artistic interventions to get people to start thinking about these types of uh, connection within technology. Um, so uh, my, my thesis research was actually in social robotics almost a decade ago now, um, and I was looking to see how people and machines work together. Um, and when you look at people and machines working together, you can think about, well, what sort of things are machines going to replace? Again, this was sort of pre uh, <laughs> the AI hype and that sort of thing. Um, so I wanted to make a machine which, uh, or a robot, which allowed people to feel like what it might be in the future to be uh, connected to a machine at an emotional level. Um, and you can write about that, you can speak about that, but until you go and try it out yourself, it's kind of hard to understand what that means. I got a food, this is good. people got out of that chair, many of them would turn around, you know, after being tickled or, or, or having, you know, tingly feelings on top of their head, uh, turn around and look at that machine behind them and, and really question what it means that a machine just made them feel that way. And to me that's important, um, A, because you can't really, you can't really try intimacy with a robot at this point in a public setting. Um, so, uh, the, the top of your head, this is a place where a stranger will come, will come and touch you. That's a very sensitive space. Um, uh, and B, when, when they get up and look at this thing, they're like, I, I just don't know what this means. And that's sort of an important uh, understanding. Um, so when we're having more and more of these machines replace more and more of human actions, these machines themselves are going to take on these human traits. So there are questions of replacement of this sort of touch um, or augmentation. You know, this is not, not necessarily negative or positive direction for this sort of thing. Um, but again, you, you really don't know, you can't discuss what it's like being pleasured by a robot until you try it, um, which is where uh, art is a great context. So right now this is in the uh, Vienna Biennale where, where people during tours are actually getting their heads scratched uh, from different countries. I'm interested to hear uh, the reactions from, from people from different places. Um, okay, so, so we're moving on to a bit more of the drug-like control technology has over us. Um, so over here I have this black box that's been sitting here the entire time. And for my next trip, I need two volunteers who would like to come up and try something. Anyone else? 
Come on. Give them a hand. Yes, yes. Like, like a young baby. Here, so put on this pair of headphones. Oh, there you go. Can you put the microphone there? Can you hear yourself? Yeah. Okay. So I want you to tell me the uh, the story of your favorite movie. Just describe your favorite movie, what happens in it. Okay, my favorite movie is... Try to speak normal, you know, normal pace. <laughs> oh, I'm thinking. <laughs> What's the last movie that you saw? The last movie that I... I watched a bit of Caroline. Mm-hmm. Okay, here. Give me these again. And tell me tell me again the last movie that you saw. The last movie that I saw was Caroline. So these headphones actually reduce your ability to speak well. They make you start slurring your speech and actually change the way your brain is processing. So same question for you. Give it a try. So tell me, tell me the, the the plot of your favorite movie. Oh, okay. Uh, it's, it's probably um, the Raymond the movie. Um, it, 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 it's it's Oh, okay. It's, it's actually kind of hard. hard. Uh, Just tell me your name. How about that? What? Tell me your full name. Oras Pompanangam. Do you do you feel like it's you're slurring your speech a bit? Yeah. <laughs> And then I'll, I'll, I'll do it myself, I'll try to tell you how it works. So inside this box, there's a system which delays your speech and feeds it back into the headphones. It also changes the tone of your voice slightly, um, which causes you to, to stutter a bit and, and change the way you're speaking. So that wasn't exaggerating there, it's really that big of a... And we can, you can try this afterwards yourself. Uh, thank you both. Um, yeah, so this was, this was interesting to me, and different people that try it have very different reactions. Uh, sometimes people that have English as a second language, it's easier or harder for them. Um, sometimes people that are on stage and talk a lot, it's easier or harder for them. Right now this microphone has a delay that's actually happening to these speakers here. So people that speak a lot with electronic things like actors or people on stage sometimes don't have a bit uh, as much problem as other people do. Um, but again, the interesting thing here is again, to get people to try this sort of thing in a safe situation where they're like, I don't know why my brain is slowing down, right? And there's no drugs, you can take these off and immediately you're back to normal. Um, so things like this are very interesting to me because as we become, we become more integrated with technology, it's going to have a much bigger control over us. And there's really nothing complicated here. There's no AI. There's no crazy things happening. Um, so if something like this simply can, can change us, what, what more advanced technology do? Um, another, the more recent things I've been interested in is uh, the unreasonable humanity in some algorithms. So simple algorithms or math that actually produce things which seem to have creativity embedded into them where there really just isn't any. I think this leads to questions of where our creativity comes from and where the creativity machines might move towards in the future. Um, so here's a little snippet of code. Um, it's a few lines of code. Uh, this yellow bit is the, here, is the actual equation that's about to produce what you're here. here. As you can see, nowhere in here do I have notes defined or even the idea of musicality or what sounds good to our ears. Um, this, is, this algorithm is literally writing directly bits to a wave file. It's not synthesizing, it's literally writing the data and then a wave file is being played. Um, so things like this are super interesting to me because uh, if you think about it, it should produce gibberish, but it doesn't. Um, again, this leads to things that might be creative, which we create ourselves. So here's a, here's a painting, a, a drip painting, um, which you know, could be on sort of any gallery wall um, as, as something contemporary. Uh, this was actually created by a robot um, <laughs> nicknamed Jackson. Um, <laughs> see a little prototype here moving around. Um, and if you, uh, if you Google later um, Judah versus the machines, you'll see Judah Friedlander from 30 Rock versus this machine, uh, a drawing robot. 
as a TV show. So this was built to have a person compete against a robot uh, and try to make a artistic work. Um, and this used something I call an inspiration module. So it allowed the robot to be inspired to make its moves by things which we can see, but also things we can't see, like tweets. Like it, it, it uh, took a bunch of tweets that only it could see. You know, it took like a thousand tweets instantaneously and used that to change its movement and to pick colors. Um, and that's a thing that we really can't perceive, so we can't be inspired by that. So that's a way machines can actually inspire themselves as well. Um, so, move along quickly here a bit. Um, then I got into sort of deep learning and AI, because that was the, <laughs> that was the big thing. So, uh, one of the first things I dived into was trying to recreate Google's WaveNet algorithm. Uh, they haven't really released it as a public algorithm yet. But I wanted to see if I could capture what makes a person's voice unique. Not necessarily the words, but the tone and intonation and that sort of thing. So here you're about to see a bunch of famous people uh, make sounds that kind of sound like who they are. Uh, this is not a recording, this is generated from a model. So that means I can create as much of this voice as I want. It's not, it's not just cut up from a, uh, uh, a sound recording. Yeah, <laughs> Okay. For this next part, I ask that no one records or takes uh, pictures of this because um, of current issues. 